The significance of world building in the storytelling process is in my mind unmatched. World building is a foundation that contextualizes the plot and fosters a deeper connection to the story. Avatar The Last Airbender in particular excels at this. The magical elements introduced offer distance to a world rooted in familiarity, leading the universe to be expansive yet comprehensible. In analyzing the world of Avatar, one can see the multiple facets in which real world inspirations are pulled from to create a truly immersive world. I'm going to unpack the major aspects of the Avatar universe to show how interesting social, political, economic, and geographic dynamics are constructed, as well as how this continually shapes the plot of the show. This drill is a feat of scientific ingenuity and raw destructive power. A focal point of the show, and perhaps the most interesting decision, was to have it be set at the beginning of an industrial revolution. This establishes the inequalities of an avatarless world, from the imperial core of the Fire Nation to the battle-stricken warfront of the Earth Kingdom. Industrialization would mark the beginning of a more globalized world, starting with the colonization of the Earth Kingdom, but over time would become so much more. The Fire Nation being the first ones to fully embrace and pioneer this revolution was by design, and is supported by geographic and magical elements. The Fire Nation's geography being inspired from that of Iceland's, it would make sense for metals to be quite abundant. The Fire Nation is an archipelago made up of several different volcanic islands, and would thus be host to many such volcanic minerals. The magic system in the world sees firebenders intrinsically being able to produce and control fire. This combination is perfect for entry-level metalworking. Another factor to consider would be intrinsic survivability. It's probable that the firebenders would be more incentivized to research industrial practices because their element isn't explicitly good for constructing things in the way others are. In the Earth Kingdom and Water Tribe, it's seen how most of the architecture, infrastructure, and transportation is built around and relies heavily on their bending mechanics. The mail system of Omashu is entirely dependent on earth bending and gravity. The Northern Water Tribe forgoes streets in favor of an intricate system of canals operated by waterbenders. Fire bending doesn't have such straightforward applications. In a volatile area such as the volcanic islands, innovation is necessary to build a stable society. This makes technologies such as steam engines not only necessary, but also more efficient due to their independence from bending manpower. The Industrial Revolution would be an important factor, leading up to and throughout the Hundred Year War. Our nation is enjoying an unprecedented time of peace and wealth. Our people are happy and we're so fortunate in so many ways. The industrial age in its nascency coincided with imperial ambitions for the nation. Ambitions that would eventually lead to this hundred year war. The key to understanding the conditions under which these imperialist ideas emerged lies within the Fire Nation's history. It's no secret that the Fire Nation was heavily influenced by Japan. Apart from the more ostensive ways this manifests, such as in the architecture or clothing, are the political and social parallels that can be drawn between the Fire Nation and Imperial Japan of World War II. In fact, the history leading up to Imperial Japan shares much in common with that of the Fire Nation. Before the Fire Nation was regarded as a single political entity, it was a rather decentralized assortment of islands, controlled by various warlords. We know this through the comic Smoke and Shadow, which tells the story of the warlord Taz, whose war crimes brought upon him dark spirits, known as the Kemuri Kage. The Kemuri Kage would wreak havoc on the warlords, until the islands were ultimately united as one nation by the first Fire Lord. This is not too dissimilar to Japan's Sengoku period of warring states, that would in time conclude with the emergence of the Tokugawa Shogunate. And much like the Shogunate, the Fire Nation would enter an era of prolonged peace under a new feudal system. The position of Fire Lord came with limited power at first, with the defeated warlords keeping their fiefs and some level of autonomy. The family of these warlords would go on to become noble clans and quite influential in Fire Nation politics. The Fire Nation at this time would rule tangentially to the Fire Sages, the religious authority of the nation. The Fire Sages took part in preserving Fire Nation culture and history in the Dragonbone Catacombs. 
It's this combination that allowed the nation to be governed with a strong sense of spirituality. Much of this lore is revealed through the Kyoshi novels. This new feudal system, while bringing some level of stability to the region, also came with consequences. The weak central government came as a detriment in times of strife, with the noble clans unwilling to share resources and often holding selfish interests. The Fire Lord was left with little power in times of plague or natural disaster. It was the arbitration of the Avatar that kept the nation from total capitulation. Inter-clan politics would persist, with different clans and families constantly making plays for power. This all came to a head during the Camellia Peony War, in which Fire Lord Zoryu and his half-brother would fight for power. The struggle between two prominent clans nearly resulted in all-out war. Fire Lord Zoryu acknowledged the noble clans as having too much power, and in an act similar to Japan's Meiji Restoration, Zoryu would subsequently initiate a reform that would over time result in diminishing power for the noble clans. This would ultimately end feudalism in the nation and set the foundation for a powerful autocracy. By the time Sozin was in power, the clans had fully lost any influence they once had, and all power was consolidated within the central government. Early industrialization brought economic stability to the nation. The famines and natural disasters the islands were prone to no longer posed an existential threat. People were, for the first time, enjoying a high standard of living. These conditions would allow Sozin to begin working towards his dream of imperial hegemony. This dream would start with the cultivation of a new culture and the diminishing power of the Fire Sages. Regional ethnic identities were rejected with people rather choosing to align themselves with the greater idea of being a Fire Nation citizen, completely subservient to the royal family. Respect and honor were paramount in Fire Nation society. Agnikais, or duels of firebending abilities, became more violent and glorified, with spectators now involved, and mercy being considered weak. With this, a cult of personality began to form around the noble family. Fire Lord Sozin started the tradition of killing dragons for glory, with the dragons being considered the original masters of firebending and quite integral to their culture, this didn't set well with the fire sages. However, over time the influence of the sages would fade until they would become more or less pawns of the fire lord. With the fire temple fully under the state's control, Sozin would go on to seal the dragon bone catacombs, a move that would further his nationalist cause. The fire nation's education system would help shape the youth and overall society he intended to build. During the time of Sozin's early reign, airbender philosophy became quite popular among the youths. To fight this, Fire Nation schools operated under the principle of subservience. Children were fed revisionist history, beginning with Fire Lord Sozin and fully misrepresenting the rest of the world. Music and other forms of self-expression were met with discipline. Further cementing the role of school is the national pledge the children were made to recite. This education system succeeded in creating a population of unquestioning, loyal citizens that absolutely worshipped their Fire Lord. The average Fire Nation citizen would graduate with a warped view of the world. Other nations and cultures were looked down upon and considered barbaric. People genuinely felt that their culture was superior, and by imposing it upon the world, they were doing it a favor. The nationalist hive mind, under their divine leader, proved a force willing to commit even the most despicable of crimes. I knew the next avatar would be born an air nomad, so I wiped out the air temples. The show's premise, as the name implies, revolves heavily around the aftermath of the airbender genocide. Early on, we see the devastation inflicted upon Aang's people but the ramifications of such doesn't fully sink in until later. The ecosystem of the Avatar universe operates on the idea of balance. The sudden extermination of an entire element of benders, as well as their traditions and knowledge, has extremely adverse effects on the world. The air nomads were raised in very secluded temples across the world. However, as they were nomads, they were known to travel quite a lot. The four air temples represent each of the cardinal directions and are often located at very high altitudes. The temples greatly resemble Tibetan monasteries. 
Airbender teachings are in large part based off Hindu and Buddhist philosophies that greatly shape their lifestyle. It's the poetry and writings of gurus long past as well as the accumulated knowledge they possess that allow air nomads to accomplish great feats. The end goal for many airbenders is to relinquish material possessions and detach themselves from the world. This form of spiritual liberation is not unlike the ideas of nirvana or moksha. There are, however, many air nomads that don't follow this sort of lifestyle. Avatar Yangchen of the Western Air Temple is revered for her work as a diplomat between spirits and the humans, specifically when she reached an agreement with the spirit General Old Iron that used to go on rampages in response to his friend being killed many centuries ago. The agreement saw that the land remained untouched by humans and resulted with Yang Chen's festival. This is documented in the comic The Rift. Many more instances of Yang Chen making deals between spirits and humans would take place over the course of her incumbency, and after her passing, she was widely venerated for the peace and stability she brought. Without Yang Chen, however, many of the treaties that were already in the humans' favor were being broken. This put a lot of pressure on the air nomads to uphold the agreements made. Avatar Kuruk would spend much of his life fighting dark spirits, disgruntled by the agreements being broken, and would eventually die young. This would have disastrous consequences, as the time it would take to find and train a fully realized avatar would allow chaos to ensue worldwide. The air nomads would subsequently step up to maintain peace around the world. This trend would persist throughout the reign of Kiyoshi and into the time of Avatar Roku. This is when the dynamic between air nomads and the world becomes really important to understand in the context of the Hundred Year War. The airbenders at this time were not all in agreement. A group of renegades known as the Guiding Wind felt that the air nomads working alongside nobility and social elite had taken them from their spiritual roots. While the Fire Nation and parts of the Earth Kingdom began industrializing, the environments would be defiled for its resources. This caused many spirits to act up. Despite the moral dilemma of industrialization and a market economy, the air nomads didn't particularly condemn it. They even allowed strip mining at the base of the Eastern Air Temple. Further complicating things is the influence airbending philosophy was having on the Fire Nation. Fire Lord Sozin's own sister, Princess Zaysan fell in love with someone from the Guiding Wind and intended to relinquish her noble material life for them. Apart from the fact that the next avatar would be born an air nomad, Sozin felt that the Air Nation and Guiding Wind were a threat to his control over the Fire Nation, as well as his imperial plans, so he went ahead and unilaterally exterminated the airbenders. As stated, the air temples were located atop remote cliffs only one with the Sky Bison could reach. It's most likely that the Fire Nation would have gotten around this with their technological innovations. While the monks and nuns in the air temples were pacifists, they weren't opposed to self-defense, or by any means weak. This along with the airbenders that chose a more violent lifestyle would make it necessary for the Fire Nation to attack during Sozin's Comet, which would enhance their firebending. It would have been impossible for the Fire Nation to wipe out all the airbenders at once. They were, after all, nomads. Many airbenders that fled to parts of the Earth Kingdom were rooted out by traps containing Air Nation relics, meant to lure in airbenders looking for community. I'm sure some probably survived, but couldn't airbend for their safety. As generations passed, the culture would near extinction, until of course Aang showed up. The worldwide imbalance caused by an entire nation being genocided would result in worsening relations with the spirits from what was already a tenuous relationship. The role as peacekeeping arbiters they once took up no longer existed. The knowledge and philosophy they were known for was no longer studied. Overall, the connection to the spiritual side of bending was lost. This led to bending that was more geared towards violence than in the past. This led to conflict with spirits such as Heibai or Wan Shi Tong. This even led to men brazen enough to kill a spirit entirely. In many ways, airbender culture being lost would pave the way for a brutal war to be fought, the brunt of it in the Earth Kingdom. The people of the Earth Kingdom are proud and strong. They can endure anything as long as they have hope.
The Earth Kingdom is by far the largest, most populous of the four nations, and as such is extremely diverse. There are ostensible influences from the Ming and Qing dynasties of China, as seen in clothing and architecture, however many inspirations can be seen from across Eurasia. Early on in the show, one of the first glimpses of the Earth Kingdom we get is the great city of Amashu. Surrounded by steep canyons, the city lies carved into the top of a mountain, only accessible through a narrow bridge. Being strategically positioned and renowned for its mail system, Omashu is termed one of the last great Earth Kingdom strongholds, ruled by its king, Bumi, who is not to be confused with the Earth King that rules over the entire nation from its capital, Ba Sing Se. This confusion, as we'll come to find, is very on brand for the Earth Kingdom, a nation defined by its discrepancy. Throughout the nation, large metropolitan areas such as Omashu or Ba Sing Se exist, housing large amounts of people and facilitating international trade. A large portion of the population, however, lives rurally in generally small towns scattered across the countryside. Among the towns of the Earth Kingdom, you'll find many different legal systems, many different means of governance, and many different cultures. It seems at times the only thing uniting them is the earthbending tradition. Just off the coast of the southern Earth Kingdom is Kyoshi Island, inhabited by a people who worship Avatar Kyoshi and continue her tradition through a group of elite female warriors. Across from them, lying on the mainland, is Chin Village, a town with an absolute joke of a legal system that actively hates the Avatar, especially Kiyoshi. Whereas the Fire Nation was able to consolidate nicely through a centrally located capital and naval coordination between the islands, the Earth Kingdom isn't able to achieve such unity. Historically, this disunification comes from continued class struggle and rampant organized crime. After the early death of Avatar Kurok and amidst the search for the next Avatar, many different factions began vying for power in the Earth Kingdom. Not much was done by the central government, as corruption was deeply entrenched in Earth Kingdom bureaucracy. During Avatar Kyoshi's younger years, the 46th Earth King would exploit the chaos and turn the nation into an absolute monarch. A popular warlord known as Chin the Conqueror opposed this and began conquering much of the Earth Kingdom. The Earth King was powerless against Chin's forces, but fortunately for him, Kyoshi would end Chin, unwilling to submit to his demands. On the back of this saw a peasant uprising in Ba Sing Se, where the Earth King was made by Kyoshi to rewrite the constitution, thus conceding some of his power. In return, Kyoshi instituted the Dai Li, a group of highly skilled earthbenders who would act as a secret service to the Earth King. The next several decades would remain relatively peaceful for the Earth Kingdom. However, many rural towns still dealt with criminal organizations and corrupt officials. The sheer nature of the Earth Kingdom meant that due to its size and geography, the central government wasn't able to exercise much control over the outer provinces. The geography varied extremely from foggy swamps inhabited by waterbenders to untraversable deserts home to several tribes of sandbenders. This extremely diverse nation led to multiple quasi-autonomous regions and many distinct ways of life. The Earth Kingdom military, however, remained a transcending force. The military was led by a council of five generals centrally located in Ba Sing Se, directly answering to the Earth King. Population centers such as Omashu and Ba Sing Se served to provide training and military equipment. However, it was not uncommon for rural men of fighting age to join the military. Across the continent are several military bases, and the Earth Kingdom armies are generally available to keep peace. Infrastructure is weak between the capital, however, and in times of crisis, regional authorities are somewhat left to their own devices. Aang, upon learning of the looming solar eclipse, created an invasion plan to capture the Fire Nation capital and end the war before Sozin's comet could return. The plan relied heavily on the forces of the Earth Kingdom that Team Avatar went to Ba Sing Se to engage. Upon reaching the Great City, however, we learn that the Earth King is entirely unhelpful. Ba Sing Se is an extremely segregated surveillance state with the large dissonance between the poor refugees of the lower ring and the elite citizens of the upper ring that have no knowledge of any supposed war. 
The Daili act in their own interests and formed a sort of police state where their narrative of prosperity is carefully crafted, squashing any sort of political dissent, complete with their very own underground re-education camp. The stark difference between the outer world being nearly penetrated and refugees actively seeking sanctity from the Fire Nation to the Earth King having absolutely no idea this war is happening is again very on brand for the Earth Kingdom. During the time of Avatar Roku, Earth King Jailin would rework the constitution Kyoshi wrote and consolidate more power within the monarch. The time period acted as a sort of cold war with the Fire Nation's expansionist moves not going unnoticed by the Earth King. Jailin would deliberately allow corruption and xenophobia to build as to not be blamed for poor living conditions. While outwardly posturing himself as somewhat incompetent, he would secretly get rid of anyone that opposed him. This would resume the tradition of the Earth Kingdom having powerful monarchs that do sketchy shit and go unquestioned. During the time of Aang, the Earth King himself had no power, rather acting as a puppet of the Dai Li, who completely dominated all aspects of governance. The fragmented nature of the Earth Kingdom allowed the Fire Nation to establish colonies, one by one. The corrupt nature of Ba Sing Se would lead to its eventual downfall as well. The Water Tribe is a great nation. There's a reason they've survived a hundred years of war. The frozen tundra is treacherous. The landscape itself is an icy fortress. The Water Tribe is, in my opinion, the most interesting of the four nations. Not much of the show takes place in the Water Tribe, but what does reveals an interesting dichotomy of two cultures struggling for survival on the back of a global crisis. Waterbenders would most likely originate in the North Pole due to their spiritual connection to La and Tui, the spirits of the ocean and moon. It would be later when a group would venture off, eventually finding habitants in the South Pole. The introduction we get to the show, as well as the Southern Water Tribe, is a rather desolate village filled with a seemingly dejected group of people. Among the tribe are worn down walls, disheveled tents, and an unmistakable remnant of their past. We learn that the men of the tribe had gone off to fight in the war, and the tribe has seen much better days. The Northern Water Tribe, by contrast, is truly a metropolitan wonder, with majestic ice buildings and inventive uses of water bending. The state of these tribes are reflective of their place during the Hundred Year War. After the Airbender genocide, Susan would spend the remainder of his life searching for the Avatar, which he presumed had escaped him. It's unclear as to whether or not he knew which temple Aang lived in, or even if he would be able to tell once they killed the Avatar. Under the presumption that the Avatar had died during the genocide, the next place to look for them would be in the Water Tribes, as per the Avatar cycle. We learned from Hama that the Southern Water Tribe was subject to multiple Fire Nation raids. The raids would see the systematic capture and imprisonment of anyone that could waterbend. This was done most likely to ensure anyone that could possibly be the Avatar would never be able to fully realize their powers. This pushed Southern Waterbending culture to the brink of extinction. The flashbacks we see of the Southern Water Tribe show a much more lively settlement with many more people and more activity in general. The imprisonment of the tribe's waterbenders would undoubtedly lead to some adverse effects on the tribe. The lack of waterbenders would inhibit their ability to not only repair their buildings, but hunt for food and defend themselves as well. This would leave them susceptible to future raids and lead to their near extinction. However, even predating the raids of the south, the two tribes differ greatly in appearance and even more in culture. These differences can largely be put up to geography and the way they've adjusted to such. The Northern Water Tribe is a single grand city with the government more akin to the other nations. The capital city is called Agna Kela and is more connected to the rest of the world than its southern counterpart. They're led by a single chief who is solely responsible for the judicial system as well as the law over the land. While the social hierarchical differences between the chief and his people is much less than the Fire Lord or Earth King, it still exists. Class differences and the Patriarch have a heavy influence in the North. During the Hundred Year War, before Admiral Zhao's invasion of the North, they were relatively untouched. The Northern Water Tribe would be nearly impossible to invade due to the treacherous walls of ice that surround the city, 
as well as a population of highly skilled waterbenders that defend it. The south, by contrast, isn't consolidated into one area in the same way. The spirit oasis of the north, being home to La and Tui, carries significant spiritual and cultural importance to the north, making sense that the tribes of the north would choose to consolidate around a single point. Not only that, but by the looks of it, the city is carved into an incredibly thick layer of ice, making it close to impossible for people to live elsewhere. A federated tribe would also have the benefit of trade with the outside. Agna Kela is located not too far from the Earth Kingdom. This would allow for a trade of goods and services between them and Ba Sing Se, which is located in the northeast of the Earth Kingdom. The Southern Water Tribe, by contrast, is not a federated state, meaning the village we see that is home to Sokka and Katara isn't the only one out there. The geography of the Southern Water Tribe resembles that of Antarctica, and the people there are largely based off the Inuit peoples of North America and Greenland. Due to their increased distance from the Earth Kingdom and treacherous waters, the Southern Water Tribe would be much more inaccessible. The tribes in the South didn't have a traditional government in the same way the North does, and they live in a rather egalitarian society. There are chiefs, but they're never given too much power. Southern food is reminiscent of what Inuit people eat. Arctic char, seal jerky, caribou, and fish making up a large part of their diet. Their housing is more temporary, and they often embark on hunting trips for food and other materials. It makes sense that they never built a single large city, as it wouldn't have been able to support a high population. While the Southern Water Tribe seems to be built more closer to reality, the Northern Water Tribe is somewhat fantastical. The city is unrealistic, and seems to have taken inspiration from a wide range of sources. This most likely has to do with the stronger presence of waterbenders up north, while the south had to make do as pretty much normal people. Despite a lesser population and being more affected by the war, the south played a much bigger role in defeating the Fire Nation than the north. Chief Okoda and the men of the tribe patrolled Chameleon Bay and Whaletail Island, where they would specialize in reconnaissance missions and sabotage of the Fire Nation Navy and supply line. Interestingly enough, the ships of the Water Tribe closely resembled the Polynesian catamaran, which could possibly indicate an age of seafaring and exploration. We know that at some point, waterbenders migrated from the Southern Tribe to the swamps of the Earth Kingdom, so it's definitely possible that more migrations took place. In fact, Kyoshi Island is a prime suspect, as it's located relatively close to the Southern Water Tribe, and it's seen how many of the people there wear blue, a color commonly associated with the water tribes. More than just being blue, the clothing is strikingly similar, with belts that wrap around their waist and having long sleeves under their short sleeves. Not only that, but Suki, when she isn't wearing her Kyoshi warrior outfit, rocks the wolf tail haircut, which is customary in the water tribe. This could possibly indicate a cultural connection, or maybe even something deeper. What's not touched on much in the show, but further expanded upon in the comics is the prejudice many nations feel towards the southern tribe, including their sisters up north. The comic North and South depicts the aftermath of the Hundred Year War. The supposed rebuilding effort of the southern tribe is seemingly a corporate and cultural imposition on their people. Earth and fire industries want to harvest the natural oil reserves for profit, while the north and their prejudice is slowly altering the south's way of life. People of the north see their actions as civilizing a group of savage people while xenophobic sentiment in the south slowly builds. This obviously has very real-world connotations. Reasons as to why the north developed this prejudice over the south most likely stems from several areas. The north's closer relations to the other nations in contrast to the more secluded nature of the south most likely led them to adopt a more patriarchal society, with some degree of stratification. The fact that southern waterbending tradition faced near extinction after the Fire Nation raids, leaving only a handful of benders scattered throughout the southern villages, whereas the north remained virtually untouched, most likely contributed to the sentiment as well. Finally, perhaps a closer connection to La and Tui gave them the idea that they were somehow more spiritually connected as a waterbending culture. Ultimately, the divergence of the two tribes creates an interesting dynamic. Most of what I've previously described is largely political and perhaps hard to appreciate for the uninitiated. Over the past few months making this video, I may have gotten a bit caught up in the lore, but I don't want to stray too far from my point, which is how this proves to be effective world building. 
For me, what fully ties the world building together is the magic system. Different bending traditions are treated by people not as weapons, but rather as an extension of themselves. This allows for many unique instances of bending, including sub-bending traditions as well. Ultimately, what defines good world building is being mutually amenable with other story elements. This means that the world should have direct influence on the plot and characters, and vice versa. A fantasy world shouldn't be a static background for action to take place in front of, but rather something that constantly shapes character development and plot progression. In Avatar, we see the world shaping different characters' outlook on life. Whether that be from royalty or patriarchy, this offers context for further character development. The world, along with the characters and plot, grow and change over time. The show takes many inspirations from our real world. The implications of that is questionable and a topic for a different video, but it does in the end make for an interesting world. Aspects such as geography, politics, culture, and bending are all thoroughly fleshed out and constantly interact with one another, giving context to other story elements. The different locations we see throughout the show are rarely superficial and often serve some sort of purpose. The intricate world by itself sparks interest and allows for different aspects of the show to be analyzed from many different lenses. The magic system adds a degree of separation from the real-life influences resulting in an immersive world that lays the foundation for quite a good TV show.